And so the title of the message this morning is Judgment, a Sure Thing. And this title comes from the, uh, the passage of scripture that we read in Obadiah. And Obadiah is the prophet, the book that we are looking at today. We have already looked at three prophets. Uh, and now we are at the fourth prophet. And that's the prophet Obadiah. And that's found in Obadiah, and it's, it's the shortest book of the Bible. It only has 21 verses to it. And, um, and in, uh, uh, at a first glance of this book of Obadiah, you come away thinking and saying, well, this is all about doom and gloom. Um, the prophet, he's just prophesying uh, doom. Uh, for this nation by the name of Edom. And so, um, here, uh, you know, and um, a nation of Edom which has uh, disappeared from history a long time ago. Edom is a nation that is no longer, that no longer exists. It has been buried in the past. It's modern day geography, if you want to think of it that way, would probably be northern Jordan. But you could not find Edom anywhere. They have passed on in history, and uh, God made sure of that. So, we may ask ourselves, and uh, why are we are looking at this book, or why is this book part of the 66 books of the Bible? Why uh, uh, is it listed among the minor prophets? Well, let me give you Paul's reason, okay? And his reason is found in Romans chapter 15, verse 4. And let me read that to you so that you can understand why is it that this prophet, and not just this prophet, but all of the uh, 12 minor prophets, and even the major prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Daniel, and Ezekiel, why are they so important and relevant for us today? What is it in this message, in this book, that God has allowed it to survive these thousands of years for us to read here at Metal Hill Reformed Church in Newburgh, New York in 2018? Why? What is it? Here it is. Here's, listen to what Paul the Apostle has to say about these prophets and the Old Testament. In Romans 15, 4, it says, Even if it was written in Scripture long ago, you can be sure that is written for us. God wants the combination. This is all Romans uh, 15, 4. Okay? So you don't forget, I'm reading the scriptures to you. This is not my assessment. The combination of his steady, constant calling and warm personal counsel in scripture comes to us to characterize us, keeping us alert for whatever he, God, will do next. So you see why it's written there? It is written there for our warning. It is written there so that we can understand God's dealings. It is written there so that as an example, it is written there so that we can look and see how this God is dealing with humankind. How is it and what is it that God is doing with us today? What is his ways? What is his, uh, 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 his methods? How is it that God is working even today? 
And so Paul tells us that what is written in the past in the Old Testament and the scriptures is an example that we can read and say, "Uh uh-huh, if God did it yesterday, then he will do it again today. Why? Because the scriptures tells us in Hebrews that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus himself said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. And that's why we need to take very seriously the entire Word of God. And that's why I like it that in this church here, as part of its liturgy and as part of the liturgy of the Reformed Church and the Presbyterian Church, Lutheran Church, Methodist Church, and many of the denominational churches, is part of their liturgy, or part of their service, is reading an Old Testament passage passage and a New Testament passage. I love that because I have always from day one been intrigued with the Old Testament and in my reading of the scriptures I have learned more about God and his dealings while I read the Old Testament stories. I see God at work and of course Jesus came to make it even clearer for us through his life and his word. Can you say amen somebody? Now, we don't know much about Obadiah. As a matter of fact, uh, his name means a servant of the Lord. A servant of the Lord. Or another meaning to the name Obadiah is a God worshiper. How many Obadiahs do we have here today? I see a few hands. I hope that before you leave here today, you become an Obadiah, a servant of the Lord, a worshiper of God. Now may I ask that question again. How many Obadiahs do we have here today? I see a little more hands. Then I need to continue to preach so that you will all understand and be able to claim and say, I am an Obadiah. I'm a worshiper of God. I am a servant of the Lord God. And so we don't know much about him. As a matter of fact, I'm under the impression that this is a pseudonym, a pseudonym of, of that Obadiah is using. That he's not using his name, his proper name, but he's just saying, here is a servant of the Lord, a worshiper of God. And he's keeping himself in the background so that you don't know him, you don't see him, and you see the message. We have a lot of preachers today that want you to see them and want you to notice them and we couldn't care less whether you got the message or not, as long as you got me. And they're trying to impress you with them than with the Word of God. I wish that people will remember the message more than the messenger, especially in the case of preachers. That a preacher can preach God's Word and people will remember the message. I used to be an itinerant preacher, which means that I travel across the northern eastern United States preaching almost every weekend. This is uh, before I became a pastor. Almost every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday I was preaching in a different church around the tri-state area and sometimes a little further. And my prayer was always, Lord, that they will not remember who preached to them. 
but that they would remember the message. That people will go home and say, what was that preacher's name? They said, oh, I, I don't know, but I know what he said, and, and, I, and, I, and I got the message. Oh, that preachers will hide themselves behind the message and allow the message to speak to us. And that we would hear God's word. Oh God, that you would put man to the side and place yourself, Lord Jesus. Amen. And that we would hear the Lord, hear God's message. Amen? We need more of that today. Well, verses 1 through 9 of these 21 verses, we have Obadiah, uh, uh, the, the prophet, bringing a judgment, a prophecy of judgment upon Edom. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Edom is a nation that's no longer. They don't exist anymore. Uh, guess who put them out? <laughs> God. He just got rid of them. Edom, let me tell you just a little, give you just a very, very brief background about Edom. Edom was a nation that uh, didn't care for Israel at all. But they try to be slick about it. They try to be subtle about it. You know, they didn't want, uh, uh, I guess they didn't, they didn't want Israel to come after them in any shape or form. But here were a people who always looked for an opportunity to beat up on Israel. But they wouldn't do it alone. They'll wait, excuse me, for the Assyrians or the Babylonians to attack Israel. And then, as Israel is fleeing, is fleeing the, the, the city, they will come out of the bushes and beat up on those who are fleeing and take advantage of them. Or, if Israel was hiding someplace, they would stand by and wait till the Assyrians would show up or the enemy of Israel would show up and they'll say, they're in the bushes right over there. And Edom was a nation. They happened to be up on the mountains. That's where their dwelling was. And if you read those first few verses in Obadiah, you would find that Obadiah is saying, Hey, I know where you're hanging out. I know where you're at. You're up in those mountains. And you think you can hide from God. And you think that God will not bring you down from that high place. Well, God is going to bring you down. God is going to expose you. God is coming after you. And in the description of those nine verses, the description we get of the nation of Israel, of, ne of Edom, was that it was a nation that had a lot of pride. <coughs> And how many know that the scriptures is very clear about how God feels about pride? The scriptures tell us that pride comes before the fall. If you see anyone with a lot of pride in them, look closely. Something is about to happen to that person they're coming down. All through scriptures, all through the, the, the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, all through all 66 books, you see God coming against the proud. The Bible tells us in James that he despises the proud. Now I had to look up that word despise. And so I can only find one word that can really uh, wrap it up for us. He hates. Yes, it's a negative. Have you ever said the word hate and somebody says, oh, don't, don't, don't use that word, hate. Well, I, I, I kind of agree with them. Don't. Unless you're talking about sin. Unless you're talking about evil. Then use the word hate. Because if you don't hate evil, and you don't hate sin, 
Jesus says you love it and you serve it. Here's the thing. The scriptures tell us nobody has gotten away with. As a matter of fact, this even goes back before the creation. The Bible describes to us in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 14 also, and uh, even in this particular passage of scripture, we kind of like see a glimpse into it. What happened to Lucifer? also said that he would rise up and, and be as high and higher as the, as the Almighty. And look what happened to Lucifer. Jesus said, I beheld Satan falling from heaven as of lightning. And you know, when I think about that passage of scripture, I want to get one picture in my mind. And I see Jesus with his combat boots kicking the devil out of heaven. Boom, and him landing on this earth and creating and making form without void, toho and boho, chaos in this world. Jesus said, I beheld Satan falling from heaven. In other words, he was there when he was kicked out. Why? Because of pride. We see it in Pharaoh. We see it in Ahab and Jezebel. We see it in Haman as he was plotting against God's people. We see it in Nebuchadnezzar when he thought himself so big he made statues and all that and tried to be, get people to worship his statue and God made him a Howard Hughes. Some of you are too young to remember Howard Hughes. Well, he was crawling on the ground with long hair and long nails and he was humble and like a maniac. That's what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. It's in the Bible. Nebuchadnezzar was eating grass. Antiochus IV, who was a type of the Antichrist and a type of Hitler, a type of, of, of one. And then we also have the Roman Empire. What happened to the Roman Empire? And we have these modern uh, uh, scholars try to uh, explain to us what happened to this great empire of the Romans. Well, you know what? You don't need any scholar to tell you what happened to the Roman Empire. You just need to read history. Hello? Let me give you real briefly, real briefly, and I mean real briefly because I'm not going to go into expounding in any, any one of them. But as you hear this, think of the nations today. Don't think about America. Please don't do that, okay? All right? You promise that you won't think about America when I read these things? Okay, thank you for your promise that you won't think about America the beautiful. Here are the reasons why the Roman Empire fell. Number one, antagonism between the Senate and the Emperor. Decline in morals. Political corruption. Constant wars and heavy military spending. I, remember, you're not thinking about any nations that is in existence today, okay? Barbarian knowledge of the Roman military tactics. Falling economy. Unemployment of the working classes. The mob and the cost of the games. Decline in ethics and values. Slave labor. Natural disasters. Here's one. Christianity. And then, of course, the barbarian invasion. Those are just 13 reasons, historical reasons, why the most powerful empire collapsed and fell. 
And so I don't want to end this message in a negative, you know, um, you know, doom and gloom and all that, because that's not all that Obadiah prophesied. Yes, he made it clear that if you have pride, you're heading for a fall. That if you think you can do this on your own, you're heading to a fall. If you have that self-sufficiency and not trusting God and trusting Him only, you're heading for a fall. Or the way Jeremiah puts it, I don't like the way Jeremiah puts it because it just sounds too uh, 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 ghetto-ish. But Jeremiah says, damn is the man who trusts in another man. That's ghetto. That's also Bible. It's in the word, the Holy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Word of God. Okay? Are you with me, folks? Yes. Okay, so you, 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 I hope that you don't leave here saying, I don't know what the book of Obadiah was all about. It's about God's judgment. It's about God's judgment against pride. It's about God. Can I tell you something? The number one thing that keeps people away from church and away from God is pride. Yeah. It's pride. And God hates it. He despises it. But Obadiah, he ends this prophecy with God's promise to those who are faithful, to those who hang in there, to those who hold on to the, to, to the Lord and don't let go. And he goes on in those passages of Scripture, in, in the rest of those passages from verse 10 all the way on to verse 21. And he talks about the knowledge of the Lord filling the earth. There shall be holiness everywhere. The whole house of Jacob, and when he speaks of the house of Jacob, he's speaking of Israel, he's speaking of the church. The whole house of Jacob shall possess their God given, divinely purchased, rightful possessions. And Jacob shall be a fire, and Esau shall be stubble before God. And so the Edomites who came from the descendants of Esau. He reminds us there, the prophet Obadiah, but not only the prophet Obadiah, but we read a passage of scripture in Hebrews chapter 12. And if you read the entire chapter, you will find in there the mention of Esau. And the way that uh, the writer of Hebrew mentions it, he says, hey, listen, learn the lesson of Esau. Well, what was the lesson of Esau? That he just took a, a, a pot of black beans and, and ate them and, 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 and instead of holding on to the birthright? Was that just it? Well, that was part of it. He was satisfying the lust of the flesh. He'd rather satisfy his flesh than to please God. But behind all of that was the pride that was in him. Yeah. And that brought his fall. And so the writer of Hebrews says, don't forget and don't go the way of Esau. Who sold his birthright for a 15 minute pleasure. Are you hearing me, folks? Man, I wish I could preach this message. Let me tell you something. The only hope for proud sinners is him who is Jacob's portion forever. And when the Bible speaks of Jacob's portion forever, it is speaking of the Messiah, the Yeshua, our Messiah, Jesus, the Christ. He is our only hope. Are you hearing me? And so, what is your choice today? Will you follow the way of the Edomites, Esau? Or will you, or the way of the flesh, to hell? 
You've heard me say this, and this is probably the hardest thing I can say. And I, I'm, I'm more of a person about grace and about God's forgiveness and God's love than anything else. But the sad thing is what I have to say right now. That there are a lot of people at the sound of my voice who are going to split hell wide open. Pastor, you're being judgmental. No, I'm being biblical. I'm just repeating what Jesus said. But here's the promise that Obadiah gives. He says, listen, if you hang on there, then you will have the portion of Jacob. And the portion of Jacob, basically what it is, is inheriting God's wonderful promises. And not only that, but you will be, you will get touched with this fire that Obadiah speaks about and that also the writer of Hebrews speaks about that God is a consuming fire well listen he's a consuming fire to the Christian who repents and allows that fire to purge and to cleanse and to cleanse them and to take away the dross we as Christians you know what happens is we're gold you know that you're gold but sometimes gold picks up dross. How many know what I'm talking about? And you can't rub that dross off with soap and water. Only through the precious blood of Jesus can you cleanse that dross from your life, that sin. Amen? I'm going to read a passage of scripture in closing. I mean that in closing. But you need to listen very carefully. So you know what I'm talking about. It is judgment time. Now listen to what the Apostle Peter says in 1st Peter chapter 4 verse 17 through 19 listen carefully I'm going to read that to you it's judgment time for God's own family we're first in line if it starts with us think what it's going to be like for those who refuse God's message. If good people hardly make it, what's in store for the bad? I'm going to read that one more time. Okay? Not for you but for those in the internet. But if the shoe fits, it's judgment, it's judgment time for God's own family. We're first in line and it starts with us. What it's going to be like for those who refuse God's message. If good people hardly make it, what's in store for the bad? Could you bow your heads with me and pray?